Please welcome my team. Yay, thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. You guys are having a wonderful weekend? Yeah. So far, so good, right? Um, so I just want to say that on your chair, you have uh, a little um, brochure like this, and we're going to go over together all the recipes that I'm going to show you how to make are included in here. Plus, you have a uh, little a piece of green um, paper, uh, which is a raffle that you can fill out. And then uh, we are giving away, uh, I'm not quite sure what time, Sherry, but uh, probably right after my demonstration, there's a big show going over there. This is where they are at, right? Um, and then we are giving away a dehydrator. So I'm going to say like maybe around 1 o'clock, since uh, my demo is at yeah, 12. Probably around 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. Yeah, good. If you're here, you can take it home with you. And if not, then probably we're going to ship it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, my name is Martine, and um, I've been working at Living Light for the last eight and a half years. And um, uh, one of the passion that we have at Living Light is we are teaching raw vegan food, uh, plant-based food diet. Um, we're making amazing dishes, and um, we are really focused on making sure that the students will learn as much as possible. We have a very nice curriculum. So if ever you want to have more information about our school, then you can visit us at our booth right after my demo. Um, but the thing is that we have amazing students that are coming from all around the world, uh, 60 different countries at least, and uh, we take them, we hold them by the hand and making sure that they understand that they feel comfortable when they are leaving our class. And I want to mention that Sarah, she been here, she came this morning to volunteer and putting uh, samples together and other stuff. Thank you so much, Sarah. And she graduated a couple of weeks ago. And then we have Josh uh, from LA, he drove from LA this weekend and he graduated a couple of, one, a month ago maybe, and he's coming back at uh, end of October. So um, Living Light students are following us, I believe, right? <laughs> Good. So um, today what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about um, the secrets of dressings and sauces and soups. And of course, we're going to have samples. And um, the main thing, too, as well, that we focus a lot at Living Light is making food delicious and nutritious, of course. But at the same time, it's all about flavor balancing and mouthfeel and texture. This is very something that we focus in on. And I'm going to show you this and prove it to you that that raw vegan food can be delicious. Especially with, when it comes to dressing and sauces, uh, I have a love affair with sauces. I'm in love with sauces. Uh, I like to make different kind of sauces and they have a beautiful texture and it has, they have a, um, a profile, uh, um, a, a flavor profile that is very um, particular. What I mean by that is that sauces are very uh, intense in flavor and they will be served as a component. Sauces uh, can be put over pasta, can be put in a, a dip or a, a, a crudit with a crudite platter. Sauces are all over the world, um, different kind of ethnicity. So again, it's all about flavor balancing. And I'm gonna cover that as I'm going to show you how to make a sauce that would be made with cashew cheese. Everybody loves cheese, right? Okay, well, you are at the right place. <laughs> I'm going to show you how to make that. So overall, um, what I'm going to show you is how to make two dressings. One will be Dijon dressing, and the other one will be a Caesar or Swedish dressing that you had the chance to taste. And then I'm going to show you how to make cashew cheese and how to season cashew cheese to make it into a cashew herb sauce. And usually, uh, today I'm going to use uh, dill. And I'm going to show you how to make a courgette, which is zucchini. Courgette is the French term. And a zucchini lemony soup or lemony bisque. Sounds good? Let's get started. Yeah. And uh, Sherry is right here and she is going to be my assistant. She's just going to stand there and look up what if I'm doing a good job. <laughs> Okay, so um, the first thing is that I'm um, thinking about flavors, okay? There's many flavors out there, but there is five of them that you have to remember. Sweet, salty, acid, pungent, acid or sour or tart, right? Um, bitter and pungent. And I'm going to go over those five, uh, those five, uh, those five uh, flavors. And uh, as you will see that the dressings that I'm going to make today, they're well balanced with all of those flavors using different, uh, different ingredients. And I'm going to go over that too as well. Okay. So again, um, when you are using those flavors, they need to be balanced. And I like to compare um, flavors uh, compared to a voice. 
and then you have you know the uh, the uh, the guy with the baguette or the stick, right? How you call it? A what? Conductor. 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 This is so easy to remember. And then the conductor will um, create a beautiful song, right? So that's how I kind of like to compare uh, flavors. So let's get started, and then I'm going to talk about the flavors as I go. So I'm going to talk about or show you how to make a Dijon dressing. Okay, so the main thing about dressing, and you can make your own at home instead of buying them, you know, in the bottle, you know, uh, at, at the in the bottles at the grocery store. So you can make your own. It's very easy. If you understand how the flavors works, then it's going to be easy for you to choose the perfect ingredients to come up with a beautiful dressing. And a dressing is usually served over greens. Okay, and greens are bitter. So the uh, um, dressing that I'm going to make today, it will have a balance of sour, sweet, and salt, okay, with different kind of fats, okay? So let's get started. So to make my Dijon dressing, one of my first ingredients that I'm going to use will be lemon juice. And lemon juice is acid, right? We all, we all agree with that. And what acid does, or tart or sour, it kind of brings all of the flavors up. Um, it kind of brings some enlightenment into your dressing. Sometimes when you are uh, making a, um, um, a recipe and you wonder if you should add acid or salt, sometimes the acid can be the first choice and it, it will kind of have you use less salt. So if salt is one uh, something that you, um, that you worry about or that um, if you worry about your salt intake, then uh, lemon juice or lime juice uh, will be one of, the, uh, one of the ingredients that you want to use. So sour uh, adds intensity and it adds other flavors and it, it will balance out the bitterness and the sweetness in the recipe. Okay? A lot to talk about lemon juice, right? And lemons are very seasonal as well. So when you are using a lemon when it's summertime and when you're using a lemon during wintertime, they won't taste the same. So even if you're following a recipe exactly the way that it is written, sometimes you will have to add your little touch, maybe a little bit more sweet or maybe a little bit more sweetness into it or a little bit more acid, okay? And then I'm going to add two different oils. So oils are fat, so I am going to make an oil-based dressing. And I'm going to use olive oil and um, flax oil. And when you're talking about fats, what they do is they carry the flavors together, and they will, give that, they will emulsify, which will make your dressing thick. So emulsifying, it is um, an action of binding the, um, the fat and uh, the liquid together, and it, it will become thicker. So it will keep those ingredients in suspension and will you know, make, make your dressing thick. So you can either use a blender to emulsify or you can use a whisk. Have you ever made a dressing that you have, you know, you're kind of pouring slowly the olive oil or what kind of fat, ever, whatever oil you're using, and then you're whisking, so you are creating emulsifying. So emulsifying is binding the fat and the liquid together, okay? So fats are not really a flavor. Fats is uh, it on its own, uh, they are in their own categories because some of the fats will have different flavors. So if you're thinking about olive oil, olive oil comes from olives and olive oil is more bitter, right? As flax oil, flax oil will be more like more a nutty flavor. Cashews and nuts have a different flavors. Avocado is, has a different texture, it is more sweet. Coconut oil is sweet as well, so fat is not a flavor. It's on their own, they are in their own categories. And you can choose the fat that you want depending on what kind of recipes you're making. But today we are going to make an oil-based uh, dressing. So I'm going to use olive oil and flax oil. And can you see the differences in colors, right? Olive oil is more uh, on the greener um, uh, color than uh, flax is more like yellow. And we like to use... Um, olive oil and flax in our recipes and our dressing recipes we want to add some omega-3 and then your dressing will be more nutritious so the omega-3 is coming from the flax oil okay all right and then another ingredients that i'm going to add we are making a dijon dressing so i'm going to add some hot mustard or you can buy dijon mustard if you want to but we are making our own mustard at living light it's a matter of taking browned and or yellow mustard seeds, you soak them in water so uh, they're going to get softer and you want to release the enzyme inhibitors. 
And then after that, what you want to do is you want to mix it and blend it with some kind of sweetener, a little bit of salt, and then you blend it, and here you go. You can make your own mustards. How easy is that? Right? But you can buy, you know, the Dijon mustard if ever you don't have the time to make the mustard yourself. And if you are making your mustard yourself, it, it can last forever almost in the refrigerator. Mustard doesn't mold. It is so strong, right? So it can last for months. So I'm going to add the um, Dijon, not the Dijon, but the hot mustards here. Right, and another um, ingredient that I'm going to add, it would be some sweetener. In your recipe, it says maple syrup. So you can use maple syrup. It is not raw, but it is a whole food, right? And it has this particular flavor <clears throat> that would be more deep than a regular sugar, like agave nectar. Maple syrup has a strong flavor, and I love maple syrup. I'm from the East Coast, and we have the best maple syrup because I'm from Quebec, right? So we're always you know, competing with Vermont, right? But we do have the best maple syrup. <laughs> I'm telling you. So um, agave nectar I'm going to add here instead. Okay, I didn't have any maple syrup. But any kind of sweetener that you, can, uh, that you can find. It could be coconut sugar. It could be coconut nectar. But I, I prefer to have um, a sweetener that will balance the mustard flavor that I'm uh, in this recipe. And um, sweet will balance and kind of, you know, kind of bring you a roundness when you are balancing uh, anything. It will balance the acid and it will balance the bitterness as well, okay? So a little bit of, you know, of sweetener will balance out those flavors. Okay, and then after that, I'm going to add a little bit of pepper, okay? So I have a little bit of black pepper here. Pepper, garlic, mustard, horseradish, wasabi, um, chilies, gingers, all of them are called pungent. And when I'm talking about pungent, think about a punch. Pungent, you want some drama, right? Because when you're eating too much chili, it's very hot. When you're eating too much mustard, it's very hot. When you're eating too much wasabi, you're going to have, you know, a nose rush, right? Uh, those ingredients are pungent, okay? And you want to use a little bit, uh, especially in raw cuisine, uh, you want to use a little amount at a time because we're not using the heat we're not using the heat to, um, to release the natural sugar that is coming from those pungent ingredients. So when you are using uh, pungent flavors in Tura, you want to use just a little bit because they can be a way more intense in flavors. Do you agree? Right? So when you are making a garlic dressing uh, in raw, you want to use a little bit at a time. And then you want to blend your ingredients and taste your dressing. And then you want to let it sit a little bit because sometimes pungents have the tendency to bloom or to keep on growing. And when you let it sit for a little bit, then after that you're going to taste and you're like, oh my God, I added a way too much garlic. But 15 minutes ago, I was just having a little bit of the garlic, right? So um, just be careful with that. Okay, and talking about garlic, so here I have a garlic right here. So I'm going to use my, uh, this is a garlic press, right? So I'm going to put my garlic in here and just crush it and then press it into the blender right here. So I love garlic. If you are not a garlic fan, then just omit the garlic. That's it. Make the recipe without the garlic and it's going to be delicious as well. So again, um, ga uh, garlic or pungent flavors, right, will kind of bring some brilliance and some intensity in your recipe. In this recipe, it will, the garlic will just you know, uh, work with the other flavors. It's not going to be a garlic dressing, but you need a little bit sometimes of punch and flavor to balance out the other flavors. They all work together. Like I said, you know, they're all voices and they want to create the perfect songs for you. Okay, so they need to, to, to sing together. Does that make sense? Okay, I know, right? Okay. And then I'm going to add a bit of mustard powder. So I have um, the, re the, the, um, the regular hot mustard which is into a paste, and now I'm going to add mustard powder. So that, will, um, that will support the very strong pungent flavor from my Dijon or hot mustard. So um, powdered mustard is a bit more mellow than the regular, um, regular mustard. Okay, and then I'm going to add a little bit of salt. So salt here, what about salt, right? We call it at school the universal flavor enhancer. Right? It will bring the flavors up, 
It will bring out, you know, the acidity of the uh, of your recipe up. It will bring the sweetness. It will bring the pungent, all of it together. And just a little bit of salt will go a long way. So we are using at school. We are leaving. Uh, we, are, we are using Himalayan. Himalayan crystal salt, which is more pure than uh, the ocean salt, but whatever good quality salt that you can that you can use, uh, please do. But we prefer the Himalayan salt. All right, and then after that, I'm going to have to add a little bit of onions. So onions, they are pungent again, right? Uh, pungent um, green onions, red onions, garlic leeks, shallots, they're all part of the onion uh, uh, family, but they all consider pungent. And red onion uh, would add a little bit of, of, of drama into this, uh, in this, into this recipe. So what I want to show you now is I want to show you how to dice, finely dice an onion, okay? So an onion has a shoot and has a, a root, I mean a, a root and a shoot. So I took out the shoot right here and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the onion in half okay I'm not going to need all of that onion this onion is very big and then you're going to remove the skin so onions are very pungent and they can be very um, intense right sometimes they can make you cry right I know yes sometimes the stuff that makes you cry is in the root so if you cut into the root wouldn't that waste it if what I heard that the stuff that makes you cry it's in the root. Um, actually, it's the whole onion. Actually, uh, that, that because even if you are cutting your your onion in half the other way and you're starting to cut your onions, it can make you cry. But I think that some onions are more stronger than others. Uh, but uh, different ways, or if you are cutting your onion di different ways or on the other side, then uh, it will make you cry if it is strong enough. Um, one trick that we do at school is that when we are cutting a lot of onions, we like to take them out of the refrigerator right before cutting them, so they will make you cry less. But everybody has a different sensitivity uh, to, um, to onions. Um, but yes? Can I just say that she isn't cutting the root off right now? She yeah. Cut it in half, but the, the root is going to stay intact while she cuts the rest so of the onions. She sliced right through the root. But if yeah. Okay, well, this is what I'm going to do now, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mince the onion, right? So as you can see, when you cut an onion, it has natural striation. And this is why I'm choosing a red onion, because we can see the peels, you know, their color. They're, they're, they're like a pink color. So there is natural striation. So what you want to do is you want to take a chef knife, where I have a Mac 50 right here, and then you are going to slice your onion into a fan motion. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm taking my knife and I'm leaving the root intact right here. Okay, because if I cut through the through the root, what is going to happen is that my onions, because there there are several layers in an onion, right? So what's going to happen is all my pieces of onions will just travel everywhere on the cutting board, and I want to keep all of my cuts at one spot on my cutting board. So I'm slicing my onion here, very thin, as you can see. Okay, and I need only two tablespoons, so I don't need to cut all of the onions, but I can show it to you that eventually, okay, what you're doing is that you're cutting your onion, and when you come from the top, then your, your, your knife is going straight down, and then you want to keep on cutting, and again, still, the root is intact. I'm not touching it, right? And then I would turn my knife the other way. And we are having a knife skill class at the school, and uh, I'm one of the instructor, and we are cutting onions, all of us together at the same time. And we cry. <laughs> but it's, 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 you know, it's all about love, right? Everybody is happy, right, Jay? Uh, Josh? Okay, so now as you can see, right, my onion is holding together, right? My root is intact. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut my onion and it's going to be finely diced. Okay? So in my recipe I need about two tablespoons of minced onion. So I'm going to measure right here. Okay? Alright. Then I'm going to 
put this onion aside right here. All right, so now I have all of my ingredients for this Dijon dressing. <laughs> and I'm gonna blend. So I'm using a Vitamix, it could be any kind of blender. You don't need to have a high speed blender to, making a, to make a dressing at home. You can have a regular one. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start on low speed and then I'm going to blend it. And again, remember there is two kinds of oils in here, right? Olive oil and flax oil. They will emulsify the dressing and make it thick enough. You don't need to blend, to blend it too long. And even you can make this dressing too and using the whisk, the whisk motion. Right. Do you like Dijon dressing? Yeah, maybe. Okay. And then anytime that you are making a dressing, you always want to taste it. It tastes delicious. So I'm going to pour some right here. And then you will have the Dijon dressing and you're going to have the chance to taste it with a, a celery uh, stick. Okay. So that's a Dijon, okay? And of course, you can make that Dijon here. You can put it in your refrigerator. And that Dijon actually can last for about a week in your refrigerator. So it lasts, um, oh, okay. Okay. Does that go to the kitchen? Yes. You need it back? Mm -mm. I don't need it back. Thank you, Sherry. Okay. So now the next uh, dressing that I'm going to make will be a Caesar or Swedish dressing, okay? I love Caesar salad. This is the best salad ever for me. I love it. But as a vegetarian, I don't like the anchovies in it, right? So we are going to recreate a amazing Caesar or Swedish dressing without using any anchovies. Yes? So your question is that when you are using horseradish in a dressing, I think it's just a matter of the amount that you are going to use. Um, this horseradish here will support the other ingredients, but you can make this recipe without the horseradish if you don't like it, and you're going to end up with a beautiful dressing as well. We just wanted to add a little extra touch to our Caesar dressing to make it a bit more different. Okay, so again, I'm going to use the blender, and let's start by adding our ingredients here. So I'm gonna add some lemon juice that would counterbalance, right, the sour, uh, the, um, the sweetness as well as the bitterness. And then I'm going to add some miso. What about miso? The miso that we are using at Living Light is a chickpea miso base. It is not a soy base. So if you are concerned about your um, soy uh, intake, then you can find chickpea miso. Uh, there's different kind of other miso as well. There's, uh, but always read the label because sometimes they would say it's a different kind of miso, but they will still use soy with it, right? So there's barley miso, but usually barley is mixed with soybean. So, you know, just... Um, Choose the one that you like, right? You want to use the, um, this one is called a, um, a mellow miso or a yellow miso or a light miso. So they call it a, a different, um, with different terms. But the miso in this recipe, miso is salty, but it's sweet at the same time. It is, and it is usually a fermented paste, right? Usually made out of soy, but this one is made out of chickpea. And it will, it is sweet and salty. So it will counterbalance the, um, uh, the sour, right, and the bitter as well. And miso or anything that would be fermented, right, would be called umami. Have you ever heard about that term, umami, which is kind of giving you that comfort, um, comfort um, flavor, like if you're thinking about aged cheeses, uh, if you're thinking about um, um, tofu even, uh, mushrooms, meat, and uh, sometimes when you are buying anything in packaged, uh, anything that would be packaged, SMG, right? So that would be, you know, anything that would be the main ingredients that would be uh, blend or mixed with other ingredients that will give you that comfort, uh, that comfort of flavor, okay? So... Did you say wasabi? No, umami. Umami? Yeah. <laughs> right. They're totally different than wasabi. <laughs> totally different. So umami will give you that comfort 
uh, flavor that you are looking for. So since chickpea miso or any miso is fermented, right, so it's going to react as an umami flavor. It's U-M-A-M-I. Umami. 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 Right? No, it's not only one thing. It is, it is a, yeah, it is a combination. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Umami flavor, yeah. Flavor. Anything that is fermented. Wine also has well chefs put yeah. wine, it has umami. So what flavor does it bring out? Does it, what flavor is it? So the miso? No, the umami. <laughs> yeah, umami is more like a general, like almost like a general term. So anything that would be fermented, right? Um, like Sherry was saying, wine is, uh, mushroom would be umami, meat will be umami. Right? It doesn't have like a specific flavor, but it has that comfort it's flavor. It's actually a chemical. A chemical, yeah. Yeah. Even yeah. tomatoes contain umami. Asparagus can be sometimes umami too. It affects the brain. It's not the plum, the sour plum thing. It's no. Sour plum contains umami. It has chemical. You're thinking about umeshobi, probably. Uh huh. Right? It's a term, yeah. It means the flavor of deliciousness. Mm -hmm. It gives comfort. But it is really foods that contain a chemical that affect your brain and make you feel comforted. So I have here a definition. Are you guys ready? Umami. It's a savory or meaty mouth filling, filling taste that is noticeable in such ingredients as aged cheeses, fermented foods like miso and sauerkraut, mushrooms, sea vegetables, and in such flavorings as monosodium glutamate, right, MSG, which is a primary component of branded seasonings. Vegetarian dishes loaded with umami range from miso soup with shiitakes, tofu, and wakame to pasta with tomato sauce, mushrooms, and Parmesan cheese. Bang. <laughs> right? We got this. I didn't have, you know, I didn't, you know, um, learn it by heart, but we kind of cover it, right? Okay. Now I'm going to add some horseradish. Okay? So if you don't like horseradish, you stay away from it. But horseradish is very pungent. Right? Again, think about punch. Right? So um, you are taking horseradish, and you can shave it, or you can shred it, and mix it with a little bit of lemon juice and water so it's going to last longer. And when you smell it, be careful, especially when you're shredding it yourself. Because you can, if you're smelling it too close, right, it can burn almost your lung. You're going to feel a heat, like a burn sensation. So just be careful with that. Sorry. Yeah, a little bit of lemon juice. Mm -hmm. So it's going to last longer because sometimes lemon uh, reacts as a preservative in recipes. Okay. All right. And then I'm going to add some tamari. Okay, um, we are using wheat-free tamari, and tamari will be a substitute for soy sauce, and tamari will have a salt flavor, right? But it will be a way more deeper as regular salt. So we like to use tamari in recipes to um, add some flavor, I mean some flavors like salt and a deeper, a lower note, right? And then we are going to use some dulse. Why dulse? I'm making a Caesar dressing, right? I want to replace the ocean flavor or the anchovies that you would usually put into the Caesar dressing. So we are using seaweed. And seaweed has the ocean flavor, right? Well, not the ocean flavor, but it comes from the ocean, right? And dulse is very high in iodine, right? So that's a really good source. And we are using flakes, okay? So dulse in this recipe will be perfect. I made it with um, powdered kelp, which is another kind of, um, of seaweed, and it's not the same flavor. And, and kelp has the tendency to thicken very fast. I prefer the dulse, me personally, but you can always do your own experience at home. Okay, a little bit of sweet. I don't have that much, but I'm going to add a little bit of agave that will counterbalance the, uh, the acid. And then I'm going to add, a, again, garlic. You cannot make a Caesar dressing without garlic, right? So here we go. We are going to add some garlic in here. Okay. And another ingredient, too, that I'm going to add would be celery. 
So in this recipe, I have um, two different kind of salty flavor. I would have, well, three actually. The miso, which is salty and sweet, right? It has two flavors. Then I added some tamari, right, that is sweet, uh, that is a salty, and then some celery. So sometimes when you are making a recipe, you can use two or three different ingredients that will be in the same flavor category. They all going to, um, they're all going to support each other. Sometimes the salt will not be enough. You want to you wanna look for another note. You want to look for a, a lower note like tamari. Uh, celery is high in sodium, right, and potassium, and it will bring some fibers as well into this recipe. And what you want to do is you want to cut it in small pieces, right, and put it into your blender. All right, and then two oils, right? I want to add the flax oil again and olive oil. As you can see the difference, flax oil is more yellow than the olive oil. Olive oil is more bitter, right? And flax oil is sweeter and nuttier, so it will balance the bitterness coming from the olive oil. All right, and I'm going to add just a little bit of water. Okay, if I blend this here and I taste it, it will be a little bit too intense, so the water will mellow down all of the flavors. Okay? I'm sorry? What is purified water? Purified? Uh, it could be anything that would be filtered, filtered water. You don't want to take, like, um, you want to use any tap water, especially if you live, you know, in the city and, you know, they're using the chlorine. So any kind of good uh, purified or uh, filtered water will be good. All right, and then I'm going to blend this. I'm going to start on low speed. I want to break down the celery, right, before I'm going to increase to high speed. So by taking your time, you're not going to end up with too much dressing along the, uh, the sides of your Vitamix, and nothing will end up into the lid, right? That will be it. Then, of course, I always like to taste whatever food that I'm making, right? Yep, that's the one here. Hmm, perfect. I love this dressing. Like I said, you know, I have a love affair with sauces and dressing, especially with Caesar dressing. So you are going to taste the Caesar uh, dressing with a piece of romaine, like you know, if you wanted to. Can you freeze the dressing? Um, I'm going to say that um, I prefer not to. Um, it has um, delicate ingredients in it, and when you are going to defrost it, um, you're going to have to blend it again, and sometimes you will lose the flavor. Um, it's not as intense as you can actually, you can. Um, Freeze a sauce, but I feel that dressing, they are more delicate in two flavors, so I would prefer not to. But this Caesar dressing, I'm going to say that I last, it, it can last, I had it in my refrigerator for at least 10 days, and it tastes good. Yep. All right, so I am done with dressings now. So now what we're going to do is we are going to, I'm going to talk about, or oh, you want, can I give you this here, Sherry? Thank you. Uh, maybe I'm going to keep this. Thank you. All right. I have one here. Thank you. All right. So now what we're going, going to talk about is we're going to ta talk about cheese. Okay. So raw vegan cheese. Uh, we like to make cheese at Living Light using different kind of nuts. And this one w was made with cashew cheese, with cashews. So what we do when we are making uh, uh, nut cheeses is you want to soak the, uh, the, the, um, the nuts first to make them softer. So they're going to be easier for you to blend. And then you're going to take your soaked uh, nuts. You're going to drain the water. And then you're going to give them a good rinse, right? Because um, they're going to be soaked for maybe two to four hours, the cashews. If you want to um, soak 
Uh, anything that has a brown skin, you probably want to soak them eight hours or more because you want to release the enzyme inhibitors, which are, are located in the skin. Cashews don't have, doesn't have any skin. So only soaking them two to four hours to get them softer. So when you're going to blend them, you're going to end up with something with a, a very nice, um, smooth texture. And talking about texture or mouthfeel, um, mouthfeel is actually um, something that your mouth will detect, right? Uh, a a mouthfeel can be anything from creamy to crunchy to, uh, to snappy. So uh, the, 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 the mouthfeel, right, your mouth will detect that, okay? And this is what you are looking for for this cheese. So after soaking the cashews two to four hours and you want to blend it with enough water just to cover the, uh, the, the, the nuts, and then you want to add some probiotics because you want to make cheese. If you are blending only the cashews and water, it's just going to be turned into a cream. You need the probiotics to make it ferment, to, and then it's going to turn into a cheese. Uh, we have probiotic as a school. There's different kind of brand out there that you can choose from or you can purchase. If you don't have any probiotic powders, what else can you choose? Miso, because miso is fermented. So that will turn your batter or your, uh, your nut mixture into cheese. So after blending the, um, the cashews or any nuts with water and probiotics, then you wanna leave your nuts, um, the, the mixture ferment between four to 12 hours. And when you wanna ferment a cheese or anything, the temperature, Right is something that you want to be concerned. If it's warmer in a uh, in a room, and if it, if it, the temperature is warm, then the fermentation will you know will will um, will will come faster. As if you are having like if it's colder, then you can leave it longer. And then the best way to know if your cheese is fermented enough is for you to taste it. And then you would, you know, um, refrigerate it after fermentation until it reach the tangy uh, flavor or the fermentation flavor that you are looking for. But most of the time, eight hours or overnight will be a good time for you to ferment, okay? Your cheese. So I'm gonna take the cheese right here and I'm gonna add it to a mixing bowl. And of course, you're gonna have cashew cheese for you to taste. And you're gonna taste it with a stick, a carrot stick that uh, Sarah and Josh cut with love this morning. Yeah, feeling good about it. Okay. Do you have a question, Yes. So when you have to soak the nuts in the probiotics? So when you are making the, the cheese, you want to soak nuts in water first. Yeah, to get them softer. And then after that, you will rinse. You will rinse the water. You want to take it out of the jar, and then you want to give a good rinse to your nuts to refresh them. And then you would add your nuts in a blender with water. Not, not the same water that they, not, not the same soap water, but water. And then you would add your probiotic powder. Yeah, yeah I tried to make cheese, but it failed. So I don't know what I did wrong. Yeah. So well, sometimes it might be maybe because uh, you let, let it ferment too long or not enough. Yeah, or sometimes maybe the probiotic was, uh, a, a, you know. Oh, okay, well, okay, so when you want to ferment, you need to have the, a kind of a source of, of probiotic to, to make it ferment. That, that's what the, the probiotic will do. After you're rinsing the nuts, right, you want to take your rinsed nuts and you want to put them in a Vitamix or any kind of high-speed blender. And then you want to add enough water to cover the nuts. And then you're going to have the probiotic powder. After, in, the in the blender. And then you're going to blend the nuts and the water and the probiotics. And then you can transfer your cashew cheese in a jar and leave it ferment in a warm, at warm temperature or in a warm environment. For about eight hours. For about eight hours. And then after that, you can taste it. Okay? So maybe the probiotic wasn't used when you made it. The one that we are using is a powder form, and it's called Ejuva, E-J-U-V-A. That's the one that we are using at the school. But any kind of good quality probiotics will make it. Yeah, powder form. We, that is what we prefer to use. You can use, you can buy some probiotics actually in capsules. And then one capsule per one cup, one capsule per one cup of cheese will make your cheese ferment enough. So one capsule that you open and you pour the, the powder in it and then you blend. You're so welcome.
Yes. Are you sure, like, what um, nuts do you um, only take the anti inhibitor uh, for two to four hours, and what nuts, like walnuts, Brazil nuts, what nuts do you eat for eight hours? Okay, so the question is, is how long you're soaking the nuts if they, are, if they have a brown skin. When they have a brown skin, like almonds, walnuts, or pecans, right, you want to soak them about 8 to 12 hours, okay? And what's happening is that you are going to release the enzyme inhibitors, and after soaking that long, what's going to happen is you'll see that the water will be kind of brownish color, and this is coming from the tannic acid that can be in the nuts. And when you are eating walnuts by themselves, without being, be, being soaked, they're very bitter. As you're soaking them in water, they're gonna release a little bit, uh, they're gonna release that bitterness, so they're gonna be sweeter. So you wanna soak them for eight to 12 hours, and then you wanna give them a good rinse, and then after that you can dehydrate them or turn them into kind of a pate or into a cheese. The pecans, yeah, pecans, walnuts, almonds, Right? As the cashews, the pine nuts, the macadamia nuts, they have no brown skins. So the reason that you want to, um, that you want to soak them is because you want to make something creamy. Right? When you're gonna, when you're gonna blend them, but you're gonna end up with a creamier texture. About eight hours. Eight hours. And on, then... On the, not in the fridge. No, no, not in the refrigerator. No, because then it's too cold. It's not going to have the, the chance to ferment. So you want to leave it at room temperature for about eight hours. Like I said, it always depends if it's warm, like depending on the temperature. And when it is fermented, then you can use it right away or you can refrigerate it and season it and use it for any kind of sauces. And this is what I'm going to show you how to make. Yeah, mm -hmm. usually eight hours is long enough. And if it doesn't taste fermented enough, add more Then you can, you can let it go for a little bit. Add more mishu or just... No, no, just leave it, leave it on the counter and leave it the time. Leave it ferment for another couple of hours. Okay. And then you can taste it every hour or two. And then when you reach the, uh, the taste that you like, then you can put it in the refrigerator, put a lid on top and put it in the refrigerator. And then you have cheese right there. I'm just going to keep on going here because I'm going a bit out of time. So I'm going to add my ingredients and then I'm going to answer your questions. So I'm going to add some miso into this, uh, into this recipe here, into the cheese. And miso, again, is sweet and salty. And um, it's just going to um, give more extra uh, low tone or low note to my cheese. I'm going to add nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast, right? Right. We like that. It has a cheesy, uh, cheesy flavor. So I'm going to add that, and the one that we are using at the school is a, the uh, vegetarian formula, the Red Star, and it has some vitamin B12 into it, okay? And then I'm going to add some onion and garlic powder. Whoop, this one is stuck in here, okay? Onion and garlic powder. I'm going to add a little bit of salt, okay? And again, what can I do without garlic? I'm going to add some garlic in here, okay? No, not at all. I've never met any. Question on the garlic. Since you're putting it in a blend, crispy blender, do you need to press it first? Can you just throw it in? It depends what you are making. So the question is that when you are using garlic and using a high-speed blender, do you have to crush the garlic? If you're not blending long enough, I would suggest you for you to press it through a, a, a garlic press. But yeah, but sometimes if you're making a soup and you're going to blend it, like let's say 20 seconds, 30 seconds, then you know it will eventually be broken down and being you know incorporated in, in the flavor. So. So if you are using miso as a probiotic, right? That's what you're saying. So that will react as a um, as a probiotic. I'm adding more miso into it just to have a deeper flavor. Before you let it shift right down? No. no. After. After. Oh, okay. Okay. And then after that, I'm going to choose, I'm going to add some um, fresh herbs. And the one that I like today is dill. You guys are okay with dill? Yeah. Okay, fine. So I'm going to add some dill here and I'm going to mince it. This recipe is very easy. 
when you are fermenting your cheese, whatever nut cheese that you are making, when you get this how to ferment, then it's opening another world for you, right? So I am mincing some dill. I'm going to add it to this recipe here. And I'm going to take my spatula and I'm going to press those ingredients together. You can add um, onions into here if you want to. You can season that cheese with different kind of herbs if you want. I mean, cashew cheese here will be savory, okay? But you can add anything to your cashew cheese from date paste or make it more like a sweet, um, sweet cheese if you want to with some um, sweet crackers on the side. So that would be the cashew cheese. So like this, um, when it is, when it is um, flavor like that, it can last in your refrigerator for four to five days. And cashew cheese, when you have it done and ferment and put it in the refrigerator, it can last for two weeks. It stands, uh, uh, it, it, it stays, um, it, it keeps a beautiful flavor for at least two weeks. So we're gonna have cheese today served with carrot sticks, okay? And I hope, and you will like it. All right, oh, well, let me add a little bit of cheese here. I have my samples right here up front. What's that? Say that again. Okay. Can you put the, after you make the cheesings, for instance, can you put them in the freezer and the same with the sauces and sour dressing? Can you put them when in the you, If you are making cheese, um, yeah, I'm looking at the clock right there. Um, oh. When you are uh, making cheese, uh, can, you, can you freeze it? Yes. That's your question? Yes. I, w I would not. I would not um, because you are going to eventually kill the probiotics and they won't be available after that um, when you're going to defrost it. And what about the sauces and the uh, salad dressing? The salad dressing, I would not. I would not um, taste it. I, I would not freeze it. And the they're, too, they're too delicate. And the sauces also don't freeze? Some sauces can freeze, yeah. Um, I, I just want to finish that because I'm running out of time, okay? So um, the um, courgette or zucchini bisque or soup, lemony soup here. I made a batch in advance this morning, so it's already served. I had a little accident this morning right before you came in. This table crashed, and I lost all of my ingredients. But, oh, I know, but you got to go with plan B, C, D, E until Z, right? Welcome to my world. But I had the chance to make a make ahead of the soup. So I'm just going to go over with you briefly, okay? I would I was, you know, going to make it, but it's all in a blender, so it's very easy. So you would take some zucchini, and you will take a peeler and remove the skin. There's nothing wrong about the skin, actually. It's just that I'm looking for the color. Look at this beautiful color. If I would have the skin in, it would look more like a green soup. And this is not where I'm going, because it's called a courgette or zucchini lemony bisque. I want to, see, I want to still have that yellow color, right? So what you do is you are... You're going to peel the zucchini and you're going to chop it. This is what it looks like when it's chopped. And then you're going to add it to your blender. And to this, you're going to add some water. You're going to add some lemon juice, right? You're going to add some garlic into it. And you're going to add onion and garlic powder. And I like to use powders, uh, onion and garlic powders in soups because they have that kind of cooked, they're going to give you that cooked texture that you're looking for. Since we're not using the heat and we want to duplicate, right, a cooked version, onion and garlic powders are sweeter than using garlic by themselves, which are very pungent, and onion as well. So when you are using the powder, they're sweeter, and you're going to end up with a better, um, a better, um, better um, flavors, like um, a more a better um, balance of flavor. And then after that, you have a little bit of salt in there and some garlic. I said a little bit of cumin. Not, not too much, but just a little bit. And it brings a beautiful aftertaste. Not too much of it. Cumin is very pungent, right? So again, if you're using too much of it, then it's going to be overpowering. And then it's very hard after that to balance the flavors of something that is very pungent. And then you blend everything together, and that's it. And the way that we did it here is that we added a little bit of paprika on top right to have a beautiful contrast of color and a soup actually stand on its own is that when you are blending ingredients for a soup all the flavors are there it's not going to be too much acid or too much sweet there's nothing that you need to add to a soup most of the time the audience or your guests will take a spoon and they will start eating the soup they have nothing to add 
not even cracked peppers on top, right? Or not salt, right? All of the flavor stands on their own. So I covered it all. So I've made a um, Dijon dressing, and it's going to be served with celery. I'm going to have a Caesar dressing that is going to be served with romaine. And I have cashew dill sauce that's going to be served with carrot sticks and a little uh, sample of the lemony courgette soup. So that would be it for me. And again, we do have a booth at Living Light. Um, we have a Living Light booth, and it's uh, close to the restrooms. And we're having desserts for sales, too, as well. And uh, we are giving away a dehydrator at 2 o'clock this afternoon. So if you didn't fill out your little uh, green paper, you can do it and put it right here. Yeah. And thank you so much for being here with me today. And thank you, my volunteers. Thank you very much. And now we're going to pass samples around. Thank you.